are finally ready to make this announcement. Some of you, I think, already know what I'm going to say, but as chairperson of the PNC or Presbyterian Nominating Committee, I'm here with news. I'm going to read this because I don't want to miss anything. We in the Pastor Nominating Committee want to thank everyone for your prayers and patience through the challenging process of seeking a pastor for new hope. With the added challenges of COVID over the past 17 months, it has certainly been a learning process all the way for us. Very challenging. Thank you for all being patient with us. It took much longer than we thought it may. At this time, we are pleased to announce that we have chosen Doug Royer as our future pastor of New Hope. We believe God has led us to this choice to lead New Hope as we move forward. Doug has agreed to be our lay pastor while he works to be certified by ECO as ready to receive a call as our pastor. Since Doug was not already in ECO and is not yet certified as being ready to be ordained, a process has been developed by ECO to make that happen in the near future. In the meantime, ECO has approved Doug as our lay pastor, and he may be able to do all pastoral duties except moderate session and congregational meetings. So he will be able to perform baptisms, weddings, funerals, basically everything except moderate the, the, the uh, meetings. We are planning to have Doug and Jill join New Hope on Sunday, September 19th and to have a brief congregational meeting afterwards to approve Doug as a deacon at New Hope. When I say we're going to uh, welcome them into New Hope, they are going to become members of the church. And that needs to happen in order for Doug to hold an office, which we are going to install, install him, hopefully if all goes well, as a deacon. And then he may go further on to take his trainings and be encouraged by ECO to become an ordained pastor. Please let us know if you have any questions. Um, see any of the members of PNC will we'll be glad to help you with you those questions, or if we don't know the answer, we will find it out. We've learned a lot over this time period. So um, that's basically all I have. I'm just so glad to be able to share that time with today.
go about demonstrating the virtues that Jesus taught us. It's good for us to remember that for ourselves. <laughs> Please join me in the responsive call to worship. The Spirit calls my children if you accept my words and store up my commandments within you, they make your ears attentive to wisdom and incline in your hearts to understand. If you cry out for insight and raise your voices for understanding, then they will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God.
news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, we need the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. trips to the beach, and thank you for fun things like trips to the amusement park, wherever we're going to go. But Jesus, thank you so much that whether we go to the beach or at home or at the amusement park, thank you so much that you're with us. If we ever feel alone or scared or whatever we feel like, you are always there with us, and we're thankful for that. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, thanks for the help, guys. You guys are awesome. Okay, that's a good lesson for us to remember to not always to hide from God. No matter how hard we try. Our scripture lesson this 
this morning is the entire 12 verses consisting of Psalm 84. How lonely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed is the one whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shields, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Here ends our reading for this morning. Pray with me. Father, we feel very fortunate to sing to you and to read your very words and to learn about you. And Lord, I pray that what we've just read in your word, that the same affections of this psalmist would be in our hearts as well. Lord, I pray that you would use your word in our hearts to make our desires consistent and like your word. And overall, Lord, I pray that you would make us more like you. I pray that the word of God, which is able to equip us for every good work, would do just that this morning. That your word would do what it does best and not returning void. Lord, please bless the singing and the reading and the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So what does heads have to do with tails? And what does tails have to do with heads? These two things, seemingly unrelated, would seem to have nothing to do with each other unless you were to find a coin laying on the ground. Pretty much in any other situation or conversation, if you hear heads or tails, the first thing you think of is a coin, because usually those things are not related. And from this funny joining of heads and tails on a coin, actually a, a saying in our English language has come from it, and it goes something like, there's always two sides of the same coin. What it's trying to get across is that the two things that might be not really related, or you don't think they're very significant to each other, 
actually belong very close to each other. In our passage, there is a heads and there is a tails. On the head side of this passage, we have the word pilgrimage. It's the practice when somebody who lives far away from a holy place where they believe that their God dwelled, they would make a long trip or they'd make a pilgrimage to that place so they could worship and be with their God. And that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is presence. It's the actual being before the face of someone, being in their presence. And these two words, these two concepts, they seem very distinct, but as we see in this passage, they're actually the two sides of the same coin. Now the thing that holds a coin together, the heads and the tails, might be whatever material it's, it's made out of, whatever, however they minted it. But what brings pilgrimage and presence together is the big idea of this psalm. And the big idea of this psalm that we want to dig into is this. That God gives us everything we need for our pilgrimage to his presence. The way that presence and pilgrimage, our pilgrimage to God and his presence being with us, the, the way those two things relate is this, that God gives us everything we need for our pilgrimage to his presence. So let's see how this unfolds in the psalm. Look down in your Bibles with me at the first part of your psalm. It says this, For the music director, on the Giddah, of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Now this is some very important information. Usually this can be breezed over, because usually we don't know what it means. Uh, these can be, so, some of these things go by weird names, like what is a Giddah? And so before we jump into the points of this psalm, I think it would be important to clarify a few things. So the psalm begins in these two little lines with some basic information about what we're reading. It helps us to read it correctly, to put on the right glasses. When you read science fiction, or when you read history, or when you read a, a, a teleprompt, you have a certain way that you're reading that. In the same way, there's a certain way that you read a psalm. So let me say a few things about what this means. So these phrases, for the music director, on the Giddeth, of the Sons of Korah psalm, these are not notes added to the Bible. Uh, some people might sometimes be under the impression that people who translated the Bible, they added these notes in order to help. But these very notes are actually in the Hebrew Bible themselves. And in fact, the Hebrew Bible makes this verse 1. In our English translations, we make verse 1, how lovely are your dwelling places. But actually, verse 1 begins with, for the music director on the Giddeth. And there's some funny parts about it. I think the thing that most stands out is a psalm. That's the most familiar thing to us is, well, out of these words I see, I kind of get what a psalm is. Uh, so what is a psalm? Well, the word psalm comes from, a, from the Hebrew word mizmor, which is related to a uh, a verb that means to make music or to sing praise. So a psalm is this piece of music that was made to sing praise. Israelites together use this as their hymn book. So it's a very expressive piece of music. But something to note about too about a psalm is, what is the genre of psalm? Am I reading a history or am I reading a, 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 a type of song or poetry? And it is just that. The Psalms are Hebrew poetry. One commentator says, The book of Psalms is absolutely a book of poetry, but Hebrew poetry is very different from our modern poetry. They follow a lot of different neat features. And because the language is different, and we have to translate it, actually very few parts of the poetry carries over. So we miss a little bit of the beauty of the poetry itself. However, there are some very cool parts that carry over. And I just want to note one before we continue with our psalm. One of the things that makes a psalm poetry is the practice of parallelism. That's going to be the big word for the day. That's kind of the lesson that you get out of this, the nugget, is parallelism. 
parallelism is a practice that you actually probably see in your Bible, is there's a line, and then there's an indented line. And then there's a line, an indented line. Some Bibles do that, some of them don't. But when Bible translators translate that, what they're trying to get across is this practice of parallelism. Well, what is parallelism? Well, parallelism is a poetic thing that the Hebrews would do. Where they would say one thing, and then the next line, they would echo exactly what they had said, but in a different and more vivid or beautiful way. And let me show you an example in our text. Look at verse 2. It says, My soul longs and even fails. Well, lower from that, you have a line that says, My heart and my flesh sing for joy. Both of these lines are trying to get the same thing. It says, For the courtyards of Yahweh, then a line down, to the living God. So this is something that often happens in Hebrew poetry, is that they'll say one line, and in the next line, they're echoing the same thing. It's as if they're saying, not just A, but also B. It's something that is important for us to know as we read along, because it helps you in your everyday reading of the Psalms, but also it's going to help us this morning understand a few things in our Psalms. So that is parallelism. If you want to talk about that more afterwards, we definitely can. Uh, another thing that's, that's said here is um, to the choir master or for the music director. And there is a general consensus that this indicates that the psalms were entrusted to the care of the person in charge of worship at the sanctuary. So there's a lot of liturgy involved, kind of like what we're doing this morning. Israel would use these songs as part of their corporate worship in the temple. And even more, and this is important to know about this psalm here, this was probably used during festivals when many pilgrims would come into Jerusalem. There was a couple festivals in the Jewish religion that were mandatory for people to come to. For example, one of them being Passover. And during that time, many people would come to Passover, and they would come as pilgrims. And when they would come to the city... A lot of commentators think that there would be a great procession of pilgrims and the king along with them, and they would sing this song while in procession. One uh, Old Testament scholar says, The anticipation of, of coming to God's presence and the reference to traveling to and entering God's house suggests that the psalm was used in procession by pilgrims to Jerusalem. There's also a prayer for the king in this passage, and the prayer that the king be accepted is evidence that the royal figure was part of the procession. And another thing that's said here is, according to the Giddith. Now, sadly, I don't have a lot of information about that. We're not quite sure what a Giddith is. Uh, it might have been an instrument that was used, or it might have been another form of liturgy. And the last note that's here is, of the sons of Korah. And something that you might remember from Old Testament history is that Korah was a grandson of Levi. And Levi was, the tribe of Levi was entrusted with the management of God's worship. With, with managing all the parts of worship in the temple. But Korah actually rebelled against the Lord and against Moses. And although Korah decided to rebel against the Lord and Moses, his descendants decided not to walk in the way of their father Korah. It actually became a very important part of Hebrew worship from that time on, writing a lot of the psalms that are in the Psalter today. So all that to say, I say this is important information because as we read through this psalm and we get at the big idea of what it's saying, you have to read it as a psalm that everybody, pilgrims, were singing together, and they were singing it in a form of poetry as praise to God. It's important to know that because sometimes it'll feel a little bit different than what we do today, but knowing that, it's going to help us walk through this psalm. So now that we've got the right glasses on, what we're reading, what we're looking at, we can see what this passage is teaching. That is, God gives us everything we need for our pilgrimage to His presence. And in this song of praise, the psalmist expresses that there are three things there are three things that God gives us for our pilgrimage to His presence. And the first thing we find in verse 1, it's this. God gives us yearning and longing 
for pilgrimage. Look at verse 1 uh, in your Bible. The psalmist says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts. Now what a phrase to say about the temple and about where God dwells. Surely he is thinking about the gold and the silver and the architecture, which was probably all a part of the temple. But he's not just thinking about the physical appearance of the temple. He's using very beloved love language in reference to the temple because he knows that the one who dwells there is the Yahweh of hosts. A Bible scholar Derek Kinder says this, How lovely is, more exactly translated, how dear or how beloved. It is the language of love poetry almost. He's thinking about the person that dwells in that place, in that temple. And he says, how dear and how beloved is this place to me. And not only that, but the very name that he uses for God is a, is a name that's always associated with the great presence of God. Look at the name that's used here. Sometimes it translates different in your Bible, but it says, O Yahweh of hosts. You know, in the Old Testament, an interesting thing is that almost always, O Yahweh of hosts is used and associated with the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was what? It was a symbol of God's very presence. And so you see throughout this psalm, this psalmist is constantly thinking about the presence of God, even in the names that he's using to refer to God. He says, O Yahweh of hosts, O Yahweh of great presence. How beloved, how dear to my heart is your dwelling place. The psalm expresses a deep desire, a longing to be with the Lord at the temple. And this longing isn't just a deep desire, it's almost a desperate, it's a desperation that the, that the psalmist has to go be with the Lord. Look at verse 2. He says, My soul longs and even faints or fails for the courtyards of Yahweh. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And these, these are such powerful verbs that he's using. To long and to faint for the courtyards of Yahweh. The, the first verb uh, kind of refers to a type of desperation, and the second one to a type of all-consuming feeling that I just faint under the great desire that they have. And brethren, notice the parallelism that we talked about before. It's not just his soul that fails, it's all his heart and flesh singing for joy. And it's not just for the courtyards of Yahweh, it's to be with the living God himself. The worshiper was excited at the prospect, not merely of being in a place, but also of meeting with a person. So how dear is this place to me? And how, how much I long to be there. He even uses a beautiful expression to to explain his desperation and, and his strong desire to be with the Lord. He says it in verse 3. He says this, Even a bird finds a home, and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young near your altars. O Yahweh of hosts, my King and my God. One commentator says, even the sparrow, this sounds again like the language of love, where one may envy anyone or anything that has access to the distant beloved. It's almost as if he's saying, man, if I could just be a bird, if I could just be a little brainless bird that could fly in through the open canopy of God's temple and come in and come near to his altars and be in the courtyards of Yahweh. You know, in an urban setting like Jerusalem during that time, it was not uncommon for houses where people lived to have a little courtyard. And in this courtyard, it'd be the place where they welcome them and have meals with them and show hospitality to them. And brethren, you'll notice again, even with the parallelism, that home and nest is parallel to 
the altars of Yahweh. When he's talking about finding a home and finding a nest, he's talking about being at the courts and the altars of Yahweh. This psalmist has a deep desire to be home with the Lord. It makes me think of a C.S. Lewis quote. You've probably heard it before. C.S. Lewis was a early Christian apologist and very poetic writer. And he says this, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And brethren, how true it is of this psalmist in this moment. He's saying no other dwelling place, no other home is sufficient. No matter how great it may be, and no matter how thankful I may be for it, it is not sufficient to quench the thirst for the eternal home I desire with Yahweh of hosts, my King and my God. And brethren, this is such a wonderful message in offering to all of us to have a home with the Lord. Because I'm so saddened sometimes by the cry of people around us who so often wish for that. I even heard it this week in a few songs I was listening to on the radio. I hear again and again, even among those in my age group, a desire for a place that they can call home. One song I was listening to on the radio, it said, said something to the, to the effect of, I'm so tired of love songs, I just want to go home. That all this talk about love and, and, and a place to be, I'm finding that I don't have one. But brethren, the Lord has given this psalmist a home, a place to be. So much so that the psalmist, at the climax of how he's feeling about being deeply desirous of being with God, he says, How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They can ever praise you. And brethren, this statement, how happy, how blessed are those who dwell in your house, they can ever praise you, that is not just true for the psalmist thousands of years ago. That is true for us today. In the same way, God has put a desire for His presence in the hearts of Christian believers. Listen to the words of Paul. He says, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He's saying, I know I have to stay here and do the work that the Lord has for me, but how I wish to be with the one who has saved me. Listen to the Apostle Peter. He says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Brethren, the Lord Jesus has made us to be born again, to desire a new home. And how greatly we desire to be there. And how great of a gift it is to have that. Brethren, if the Lord had not reached down into our lives, we would have desired many other homes which were not His. They would have looked soft. They would have seemed to have many cushions and many amenities. But in the end, that pathway leads to no home at all. But the Lord, with great hospitality, has planted this desire in our hearts. So that we may say, I will make the pilgrimage. I desire to go be with the Lord. And so I will go make this pilgrimage, however far and long. So that I may be with him. And it shows us the big idea of this psalm. That the Lord gives us everything we need. To make our pilgrimage to his presence. So the psalmist knows that the Lord has given him a deep desire to be with him. And while the pilgrim is in a foreign land. He yearns for him. 
But the Lord hasn't only given the psalmist a great desire to make the pilgrimage. He has also given the psalmist another thing that we see in this passage. And it's this. The God, that God gives the psalmist strength for the pilgrimage. That God gives us strength to make the pilgrimage. Look down in your Bibles at verse 5. He says this. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. In their heart are the highways to Zion. Or in their heart is to make pilgrimage. So in the previous stanza of verses we had, he expresses his desire, and then he sums it up with, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Well, now he's making a similar statement to start off his point. He says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Now, what does this mean that his strength would be in him and that in him are, are, are the high, in his heart are the highways to Zion? Well, this, this word highways is a word with two possible meanings. It could either mean a road that people would, would travel to go to Zion, or it would refer to a, a, a way, a sacred way for processions. Um, kind of like how they would make a procession in the liturgy when they would use this psalm. But we can conclude that if a man's making a pilgrimage, that probably what it refers to is these broad roads that they travel to make it to Zion, to make it to Jerusalem. And there's something beautiful here, and I'm going to have to bring up parallelism again. Uh, it's going to help us. There's parallel lines here. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, matches with, in their heart, are the highways to Zion. So the man whose strength is in the Lord is also the man who has it in his heart to walk the highway, to travel the road, to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And what that means is that those who desire, that was a previous point, to, to have yearning to make the pilgrimage, that those who desire to make that pilgrimage, those are the same people that the Lord will give strength. So what this means, brethren, is that if the Lord has put it in you, a desire to walk the Christian life and make pilgrimage to the very end till you reach the presence of God, brethren, he will give you the strength necessary to make that walk, to make that pilgrimage. And we see it in the next verses as well. Verse 6, it says this, Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain covers it with blessings, or with pools as well. Now the valley of Baca, what is that? Well, if you try to Google it in your Bible, you probably have a hard time finding it because we don't really have any other reference to where the Valley of Baca might be. Uh, but Baca is related to a word that talks about a certain type of tree. And these trees grew in very arid and hot places. And oftentimes would depend upon those early rains or whenever they could get rain because they would sap a lot of it up. And so when he's talking about the Valley of Baca, he's talking about a very dry, arid, tough place to travel through. It wasn't easy. You, you were putting in the sweat and the work it required to travel through there. But what's interesting is that these pilgrims, as they travel through this very hot, arid place, a, a place of, of, of hardship, the psalmist says, they make it a spring. The early rain covers it with pools, with, with blessings as well. And you'll notice that there's kind of an active and, and a passive element here. On the one hand, on the active part, they're the ones making it a spring. Even though they're traveling through a very hard place, it's almost as if they are counting it all a joy. But not only that, there's a passive element. The early rains cover it. That nothing they can help. The early rains come in and cover it with pools as well. 
And I think one commentator summarizes this really beautifully. He says this, They make it a place of springs. This is a classic statement of the faith which dares to dig blessings out of hardships. But God may also choose to send rain, which comes through nobody's enterprise and can bring a whole area to life. For he has more than one way of dealing with our dryness and with our hard times in life. Because, brethren, on the one hand, these psalmists, God is giving them the strength to count it all a joy and make the dry and arduous journey a place of springs and a place of joy. And not only that, but God can send in rains, an early rain, to help them along the way. Because we know that God is a God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of affliction. And brethren, what this poetically shows is that not only does the Lord give you the desire to make the walk of faith, the pilgrimage, the journey home to be with the Lord, but He also gives you the strength you need. All of the strength you need to make this spiritual journey is found in the Lord. And no matter how hard the pilgrimage is, the psalmist feels more strengthened the closer he gets. Look at verse 7, the next verse. It says, they go from strength to strength until each one appears before God in Zion. From strength to strength. As he goes from Shiloh to Hebron, and from Hebron to Bethel, and from Bethel to outside the gates of Jerusalem, wherever he's traveling to, he is not going from strength to weakness to, I don't know if I can make it. Brethren, he is going from strength to strength. Every chapter of hardship in his life, the Lord is giving him the strength necessary to make it through until he reaches the end, God's presence. And brethren, the Lord does the same for us. Whether it be through death, or famine, or hardship, or depression, or poverty. Brethren, whatever it may be, however hard the circumstance looks, in the background, the Lord the whole time is taking you from strength to strength, to new heights of strength, to make it to the end, until each one appears before God in Zion. And brethren, how true this is for our lives as well. You have assurance that the Lord will give you strength to make it till the end. And at the climax of this thought, there's an awkward break in the psalm, you might notice. We were talking about God's presence and our yearning there and the strength he gives along the way. And then all of a sudden, there's a prayer for the king. And it seems a little bit odd. It seems to kind of break up the flow of the passage. It's, it's down here in verse 8. O Yahweh, God of hosts, hear my prayer and give ear, O God of Jacob. Look at our shield, O God, and have regard for the face of of your anointed one. Now, why would the psalmist, in the middle of this thought, this, this, this comforting thought about how he gives us strength, why would he throw in a prayer for the king? It, it seems a little bit out of step. Well, let's note a few things. Uh, the king is referred to as the anointed one. You find a lot in the Old Testament that the anointed one is a phrase that's used a lot to refer to the king. And this king is referred to as a shield. He says, look at our shield, O God. They're in parallel lines, so the shield is the same thing as your anointed one. And as we talked about before, this psalm was often used in the liturgy, uh, the worship services of Israelites. So that when many of the Israelites would come into Jerusalem... In a great procession of pilgrims and the king, they would often sing this psalm. And, and so, if the king was in the procession with them, 
then very often it would make sense to offer up a prayer for the king. And, and that makes sense in, in terms of maybe the, the cadence of everything. But in terms of, of the thought process, why? Why a prayer for the king? Well, I think there is a piece here that's worth noting is that they're referring to the king as the shield, as a type of protector. That the Lord has ordained that there be a king so that the Israelites could make their pilgrimage in safety, with the guarantee that if the king is protecting the nation, then nothing will hinder their opportunity to go and be at the temple. And brethren, it's worth noting that the temple and the Davidic king are inseparable. Whose idea was it at first to build a temple for the Lord? It was King David's. The first one to think of an idea that we need to build a physical temple, it was King David's. And the Lord told King David, David, you're not the one who's going to build it for me. It's going to be one of your descendants after you. And we know that the descendant after him who built the temple was Solomon, and Solomon built the temple. And every Davidic king after that acted as a protector so that Jews could come to this temple in safety and worship. It's as if the psalm is saying, our shield, that's the person who protects us, is the person you anointed. That's the person you recognize to be our protector. And so God has ordained that he strengthens the pilgrim for the journey, as well as appoint a king to ensure the pilgrim has an opportunity to safely make it there. And brethren, that could not be more true today. When the Lord told David, you are not the one to build my temple, he was not only talking about Solomon being the one to build the temple. Believe it or not, the one who would also build the temple after David, the Davidic king who would build the temple even after Solomon, would be Christ himself. Brethren, today we will not worship in a temple made with hands. We will worship in a temple made of the spiritual persons, born again, who desire to worship the Lord. That will be the temple that the Lord has made for us to worship in. And brethren, because Jesus Christ is King, and He is sovereign over everything that happens in this world, He will ensure that you safely make it home to that temple. There are many other nations who wish to disrupt this. Even right now in current events, there are groups of the Taliban in Afghanistan, the turmoil right now, seeking out Christians, interrupting their ability to worship the Lord. Brethren, though Christians may suffer, and though they may be martyred, rest assured that our King shall not let his worship be interrupted. He shall not let our journey home to his presence be interrupted. The Lord will bring all of his people home from their pilgrimage to worship him because he is king. And if you desire to be with the Lord one day to worship him, brethren, rest assured, he will strengthen you for the journey. And because he is king, and he is your shield, he will bring you home to the end of that journey. So we see in this passage, the Lord gives us the yearning and the strength and protection we need. And then I want to bring to mind a last thing. That not only does the Lord give us yearning for the pilgrimage, and not only does he give us strength for the pilgrimage, but he also gives his presence along the way. Look at verse 10. He says this. Better is a day in your courtyards than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be at 
the threshold, or just be a doorkeeper of the house of my God, than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Why? Why is it so much better to be in the temple than to be in the tents of wickedness? I'm sure in the tents of wickedness they have all kinds of amenities. They have popularity and, and, and wealth and, and, and they keep other people in fear and they have other power. Sounds like in human terms a pretty great place to be. But the psalmist says, no. Not, not even a thousand days there would, would come equal to one day in your temple. Why is that? Well, verse 11, because Yahweh God is a sun and a shield, Yahweh gives grace and honor. He does not withhold good from those who walk blamelessly. The Lord is a sun and a shield. Everything you need to give you the strength and energy, everything you need to cover and protect you to make the journey, that is the Lord. Along the way, giving you grace and honor, looking upon you with a smile and with favor. All that to mean this, that he does not withhold good from who? From those who walk blamelessly. From the, from the blessed man who is trusting you. Brethren, you notice this, that God is a, is a protector, a sun and a shield. That God is a God who gives everything you need, does not withhold any good from you, not just when you're in the temple, but when? When you're walking blamelessly and trusting Him. The Lord is with you, protecting you, and giving you everything you need along the journey, while you're making the journey. Not just when you finally make it. While you're making the journey, he is giving you everything you need. He is there with His presence. As God's blessing was not limited to the temple courts, the blessing on those who dwell in the house of the Lord may well be extended to all who do the will of God. They dwell in His presence wherever they may live. And brethren, that is not just true for the psalmist, but for us today, the Lord Jesus says, I am with you to the end of the age. So we see that God not only gives his people yearning and strength for the pilgrimage, for the faith journey to his presence, but he also gives us his very presence along the way as well. And in response to what we've read and what we've seen this morning, that God gives us everything we need to make it to the end of our pilgrimage, the psalmist ends with this. Blessed is the man who trusts in you. Brethren, we can trust him. We can trust that he will give us everything we need to make it to the end of our journey. Father, would you help us? Would you help us trust you? As hard as the journey may get, Lord, deepen our desire to be with you. Deepen our strength for the journey. And Lord, deepen our experience of your presence with us along the way. So that, Lord, we may walk blamelessly before you trusting you all along the way. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And we will now sing a hymn, Rejoice the Lord is King, on page 140 of your hymnal. And if you are able, I ask that you would stand and sing.
and to recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. For the third day, he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. At this very moment, Jesus Christ represents us before the Father. If we have any doubt of any, of any, sin, of any sin in our life that would prohibit us from praying to the Lord and talking to the Lord, Jesus Christ is our assurance that those sins have no hold on us. Jesus Christ has taken away all our sins. And he stands before God, interceding for us. So that, Lord, we bring our petitions to you. Lord, would you help us to live obedient lives? Please help us to live in a way that is worthy of the gospel. And give us boldness to share the gospel with those around us. And, Lord, help us to bear one another's burdens and to build each other up into the spiritual household of God. Lord, we also come to you with our very physical needs. Lord, we have many needs of, of sickness. There are heart problems. Lord, there are, there are people in the hospital suffering with COVID. There are people with upcoming surgeries. Lord, you know the cries and petitions of our hearts. Please be with these people with our brothers and sisters, and give them comfort. And Lord, also touch them with your healing hand. If it would so please you in your gracious will, please reach out and give your healing touch. And Lord, we also pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom to lead our nation wisely on the local and the state and the federal level. Give all those in charge wisdom and conviction from your word. God, we pray for your global church and we remember this morning those suffering for the sake of the gospel. Lord, would you give them strength to be bold? Would you give them boldness? And Lord, the people who are persecuting, would you give them grace to believe and to stop their persecuting and to begin a new life in Jesus Christ? Lord, we ask this all in your beloved Son's name. And we ask also, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will now take the offering.
use this offering and these funds in a way that would further your kingdom and bless your people. Help us to continually be thankful and generous and so further your name. In Jesus Christ's name. And now we have a hymn as well. Lord, dismiss us in thy blessing. Page 79.